Okay. Well, we're in Espoo, Finland at Aalto University in the office of Teemu Kahonen. And, uh, and this today is uh, April 16th. I'm a little jet lagged. It is April 16th, 2015. Uh, Aalto University is in Espoo, Finland. Uh, and so, uh, and I am Don Wunsch. I'm a Mary Kay Finley, Missouri Distinguished Professor of Computer Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology and Chair of the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society History Committee uh, that is conducting these interviews. And uh, so uh, today we're here to conduct an interview with Tewo Kahonen. Uh, he, he's internationally recognized for his work on self-organizing feature maps and, uh, and we're in his office uh, at Alto University. Um, so thank you very much Tebo for agreeing to this Thank interview. you for coming. Oh, it, it, it's a wonderful uh, experience always to see you. The, the first time I met you was in the 1980s and it's, uh, it's <laughs> wonderful to, uh, to come back and, uh, and interview you for, uh, for the history of the field. So um, would you, um, so, uh, so when you retired, this institution was known as Helsinki University of Technology. Right. But I assume that your current title is Professor Emeritus of Alto University. Is that uh, is actually that? before I retired from this university? I was a, a long time a so-called academy professor of the Academy of Finland, where mm -hmm. I got my salary for many many years, and so I retired as an academic professor. Oh, good. So I could get my uh, retirement plan from the Academy of Finland. Ah, oh, good, good. So you're emeritus professor academician. Uh, and academician is just a, a permanent name, title. Uh, name, name, name uh, we title that we use uh, because there are 12 academicians only. Wow. That's in all good. fields of science. Wow. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, well, great. So, uh, so um, that, that's the title. And uh, please tell me about your formal education and training. I starting with the high school or whatever. So when I went to high school uh, and uh, before my uh, final examinations, uh, I was very interested in physics. I had a very good teacher in mathematics and physics uh, and he encouraged me to enter some kind of scientific field. I was also interested because uh, I was doing all the kinds of experiments myself, like uh, the kids do chemical and uh, physical experiments and building things like uh, motors or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, being an engineer was quite natural for me. Mm -hmm. My uh, greater, my bigger brother, who, who was, uh, he's now uh, deceased, but uh, he, he was uh, 12 years older than I, mm -hmm. and uh, he was also an ele ele electrical engineer. Oh, so wow. actually I followed his footsteps. Oh, wonderful. Wow, mm -hmm. great inspiration. What was his name? Uh, his uh, his uh, electrical engineer, name, name was uh, Tauno Kohonen, Tauno Kohonen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, it's important to capture for history your early inspirations. So, yeah. um, any other early inspirations? Well, being a scout uh, uh, gave a practical view to things, and uh, then uh, in the scouts, scouts, Boy, Boy scouts. scouts, yes, that's wonderful. I was in Boy Scouts too. <laughs> I'm an Eagle Scout. Yeah. Yes, it's we learned all kinds of skills, and so I'm a very practical person, as you know. <laughs> Not the theoretician at all. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thrilled to know that. Uh, there you go. If you want to know about the value of Boy Scouts, uh, what a great example. That's yeah. <laughs> wow. Great. And, uh, and so, uh, and where did you go to university? It was the same university. It is called the University of Technology. Uh, and uh, it was only for technological sciences. It was situated in downtown Helsinki. We moved here in 1959. I was uh, one of the first persons to move to the new buildings. The old building is right next to the huge Lutheran Cathedral, right? 
Uh, the old building is uh, at the harbor of Hietalahti. Oh, okay. And uh, it is now used by a technical school. Oh, okay. Wow. Wow, that's great. And uh, and so um, was your uh, so was your doctorate in some type of engineering? Your, and your Actually, I was a physicist. I started as an engineering physicist or applied physics. Uh, and uh, my, my doctor's thesis was on uh, the lifetimes of positrons, uh, measurements of lifetimes of positrons in the sub nanosecond region, where I was developing all sorts of major electronic measuring equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to have very good detectors for the particles and uh, also very good uh, time measuring. And, and uh, the wiring was actually through the, through the uh, coaxial cables and uh, so, so that, that nanosecond techniques is quite different if you are working in a macroscopic uh, region. That's what, what's so valuable about the PhD and uh, it's good for students to realize that the PhD is learning about how to learn so you can become an expert in something for the purposes of a PhD and gain an international reputation in something completely different. And but this is a very interesting story because uh, I started as a physicist uh, and after my doctor's thesis I was uh, actually uh, uh, um, I, I started to work as, as a professor in physics but uh, as a special duty of teaching electronics because I was an electronics expert mm -hmm. and uh, my very special duty was to teach computers which I had, ne I had never learned <laughs> so <laughs> A few weeks before every lecture, I had to study how the computers are built. Wow. So I was not quite happy with that uh, solution, but that was the only possibility in our country. We had not enough people. The mm -hmm. electronics people were needed uh, even for that kind of duties. So I was also thinking that uh, in uh, the computer technology, hardware technology, you cannot uh, publish m very much science. So. I decided uh, that I should move to some kind of information sciences and at uh, that time the learning machines and uh, whatever was there was very interesting. I happened to read an article in a, in a, a non-profit uh, journal called the International Science and Technology on learning machines mm -hmm. and I, it, I was immediately caught by the idea. About what year would that have been? Sometimes in 1962. Mm. But uh, I, I had to teach uh, computers, so I could not start real scientific work. But uh, the turn uh, started uh, when I was in the United States for one year, from uh, 1967 to 68. Where were you visiting? Uh, uh, the, the University of Washington, That's Seattle, what I Washington. Thought. Uh, Endrick Notches, you were Yes, he invited me there. Yes, um, when you came in the late 1980s to visit, I was a doctoral student. Exactly. And we were sitting in an office across the table just like this, yeah. you and me. And, 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 <laughs> and, and we were just discussing things. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that was because uh, Endrick had brought you to campus. And, and, mm -hmm. and so you, you wanted to meet with the students who were studying neural networks. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's... Uh, it's amazing how uh, how things cycle over the years, but but yeah, uh, I thought it was University of Washington because I remember back then you were telling me that you had visited uh, University of Washington. Yes. Uh, so that was for one year uh, back in the late sixties. Nineteen sixty-eight, sixty-nine. Oh, very good, and um, and, and so. Was that an opportunity to get more active in the area of neural networks? Was that uh, not really, because uh, uh, the people who were mainly interested in uh, artificial intelligence techniques, which is this MIT uh, type of studies, and uh, nobody was studying uh, uh, analog uh, uh, neural networks. But I had some ideas, and uh, I had just uh, studied some articles on uh, associative memory, and also the biological articles on memory. And I noticed that the doctors at times thought that as memory works on RNA molecules, the memory traces are RNA molecules, which is crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I thought that I must have another explanation, which is more like a distributed network. 
uh-huh. distributed memory traces, where I got this idea of the correlation matrix memory. Mm-hmm. But it turned out later that there were two other guys who had had similar ideas, uh, Jim Anderson from Brown University and uh, th- there is uh, this uh, Dr. Kaoru Nakano from Tokyo University. Uh-huh. So mm-hmm. we were actually the three guys who, who were interested in distributed associated memory. Aha, aha, fascinating. Then we started to, to study uh, applications. Uh, when I came back to Finland, we started to study uh, pattern recognition techniques. I was trying to apply my correlation matrix memory. It didn't work very well. I was uh, developing an optimal mapping based on the pseudo inverse matrices. It worked much better, but I was still not quite satisfied. And uh, then we started to use some kind of learning systems, uh, the learning subspace method, so that a class region was equal to one subspace of patterns, pattern vectors. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I was rotating these subspaces by a learning scheme, and we got very good results in the speech recognition. So we were recognizing Finnish spoken speech, uh, I mean a dictated speech. Uh, so we wanted to have a, 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 a transcription of mm-hmm. the whole speech, like every phoneme separately. Oh! And oh. Uh, when we had uh, names or even very simple sentences, our accuracy was uh, something like 95% for one person when he mm-hmm. gave his samples. Mm-hmm. And only for male p- speakers. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the, this uh, study of uh, speech recognition has continued since then in this laboratory, not based on my ideas, but uh, on uh, hidden Markov models, but they have used my post-processing methods there, and uh, now they can uh, transcribe uh, continuous speech uh, from a newspaper reading or something like that, uh, in Finnish and in English at least, mm-hmm. at the same accuracy, but uh, without any pre-given samples. No mm-hmm. speech. Well, it's uh, uh, it's it's very interesting that you that you mentioned that you worked uh, uh, early on with the pseudo inverse methods because uh, tomorrow I will be serving as the opponent for the dissertation defense of uh, Mark van Heuswijk, yeah. and and he's using extreme learning machines which prominently feature the pseudo inverse. So uh, <laughs> all these decades later, and some very similar ideas uh, come back into the yeah. uh, into the yes. field. I, I think that the inversion problem should be discussed more in neurosciences, neural, uh, neural network theories. Mm-hmm. But I haven't noticed uh, much. Uh, Oh, that kind of, it's more like input out of mappings and deep networks, whatever, but uh, but this pseudo inverse, uh, this would be connected with cognitive science. Mm-hmm. I haven't been doing that, uh, except in my very first books. Uh, my second book was on associative memory. Okay. And I have a That's sentence, I have a sentence of this book. Uh, okay. Uh, where I, I, I was a uh, uh, mentioning a principle of associative memory as it is uh, implemented in our brain, uh-huh. my theory. Nobody understood it, it was never accepted. I, I had written even a model on the uh, memory, which is not a pseudo associate memory, but some kind of, uh, let us say, like a, a virtual em- memory, virtual image memory, mm-hmm. so that uh, actually what we are perceiving are virtual images, like the Fresnel holograms. Uh-huh. When you're looking at the hologram, you see the virtual image over there. Yeah. So, but uh, I think that I'm still the only person who has ever understood this. <laughs> well, I, I think that the holographic paradigm of, uh, uh, of information processing is, is certainly a fascinating idea. It's Except that it is not implementable in the brain because we don't have these uh, coherent waves and we have the same kind of accuracy. But I was using uh, correlations in synapses, mm-hmm. memory traces which are pr- proportional to the correlations of the synapses, and in that way I am able to demonstrate a few uh, phenomena which uh, are the same as the virtual memory. Mm. 
but uh, I haven't published, uh, I haven't mentioned all of these in my books, in uh -huh. these two books. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, I went to very practical things like uh, data analysis. Oh, of course, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of very exciting work that, that, that you did in data analysis. So let's, uh, let's show both of these books just to show them. My second and fourth book. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, great. Um, well, um, so, uh, so that job that you had teaching, was that your first job uh, after your student days uh, to be a teacher? Did you have another scientific job before that? Actually, after my graduation as a diploma engineer, I got a fellow fellowship from the uh, um, Atomic Energy Commission of Finland. Mm. And uh, I was uh, their research assistant. Uh, then I made my doctor's thesis on the positron uh, uh -huh. lifetimes uh, on, on this uh, uh, fellowship. But uh, when I was uh, actually a nominated professor, so I started to st teach computers and uh, then I taught computers and I was uh, many, many years free of duty as the academy professor. Uh -huh. Now, um, in Finland, do they have a system like the habilitation, or do you do you get the PhD and then and then move into academic job? We don't have any habilitation okay. like in like in Germany, but uh, uh, of course, uh, when we apply for a professor, then we have to give uh, samples of our teaching and uh, uh, samples of publications and and uh, uh, like everywhere, like right. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and so um, speaking of papers, uh, was your first paper published on the topic of the positron? Do you remember what your first paper was? Yes, uh, there were conference papers and uh, uh, mostly conference papers. I didn't uh, publish uh, on the positrons in any journal mm -hmm. because I moved so fast uh, to other fields of science. And uh, then we we were sometimes constructing a kind of laboratory computer just uh -huh. for demonstration uh -huh. and on that we published some papers but uh, like I mentioned uh, I found out uh, that it is very difficult to make a, a scientific publication in a faraway country like Finland uh, as we are contrasted with the publications of IBM and uh, so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, so um so then you moved into computational intelligence, and what was your first computational intelligence-related publication? 1972, it was the Associated Memory Model. Okay. Yeah, that was in a iterately transactions on computers. Oh, okay. Great. Wow. And so, uh, and, and you did that from, from here at Helsinki University of Technology? Exactly, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. I was already professor, then I, I returned, had returned back from the United States and uh, I started with young students and so on. But uh, this idea, which was completely my own idea, I published myself. Then, uh, then there was a long line of publications that the optimal associated memories, learnings, and memories, subspace memories, and so on. Uh, and uh, continue until t today, so to say. Wow, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, this recent book of yours, uh, when did this one come out? Uh, it was uh, before Christmas uh, last year. Oh, wow. 2014. Okay, so only about five months old. Uh, and and uh, if you want to uh, read this book, it is uh, uh, accessible in the internet. Take uh, my uh, article in Wikipedia, Teuvo Kohonen, okay. and the first literature reference is this book. Okay, MATLAB implementations and applications of the self-organizing map. This is available online. And so there, there, there is link. There is a link in that article, a Wikipedia article. Excellent, great. So I'm sure a lot of people are now already. Now I get plenty of loadings after this. I <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm sure that a lot of people are already reading this, and and uh, MATLAB is such a. a 
a user-friendly way to experiment in the field. So uh, yes, yes, this is uh, uh, unfortunately it is a bit expensive, and there are uh, some, some others like the Python or something right. which are free. But uh, uh, we had used the MATLAB so long, and in right. Finland uh, the mathematicians are almost using all uh, the MATLAB, and uh, so I, because we had ready functions which we had developed. Uh, 200 functions or so, then I thought that uh, I must uh, use these functions uh, to explain how to make the scripts for right. different problems. Well, most of the large engineering schools like yours and mine in, in Europe and the USA at least have uh, access to MATLAB, so uh, it, yes. it's a very, uh, a very good way to go. Um, <coughs> okay, so. Um, so you've already talked a little bit about what inspired you to get into uh, engineering and science, uh, and you talked about a couple of people, the, the high school teacher and your brother. Uh, what was the name of the high school physics teacher who... Erki Arkimo. 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 Er Erki Arkimo. Yes. Okay. Well, very interesting. So the, the first name of your inspiring teacher uh, also, is the first name of uh, perhaps your most famous student. So <laughs> <laughs> my first doctoral student, oh. Erki Oya. <laughs> yes, I'm going to interview him later today. So Please. both winners <laughs> of the Pioneer Award, and mm -hmm. and so uh, it's amazing how many things come full cycle in this world, yeah. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Then of course I had this professor uh, whose uh, uh, name is Erki Laurila, also Erki. Oh, oh, great. So. Uh, he was a, a very good teacher and a very humane person, so he, he was giving all sorts of advice for life and uh, your work and whatever. So. Oh, that's one of the fun things about being yeah. a professor, yeah. isn't it? That, that, uh, you know, you got students that came away from home and, uh, and they're experiencing something new in their life, and as a professor you can, you can help them in many ways, not just... Yeah. Uh, I, I was his uh, uh, assistant for... Uh, exercises, but uh, then while he was uh, working as uh, some kind of governor in, in the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, I had to lecture some of his courses. And that was Erki, what was his last name? Erki Laurila. Laurila. Yes. Okay. He was also an academician, but at uh, that time the academicians were uh, professional academicians, so they got a salary. Now it is only a title. But a wonderful title if there's only 12 <laughs> in all of Finland. That's, a, that's amazing. Uh, uh, not surprising, uh, 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 an amazing accomplishment, but in your case it's clear that you would be uh, a, a person to be suitable for that role. Um, so uh, you talked a little bit about when you got involved and what triggered your jump into that uh, technology. Uh, and so, also, your, your first activity in computational intelligence was these investigations and publications. Um, uh, and so, when, uh, when you moved into your, your research on, on neural networks, of course, one of the challenges was uh, uh, being in a location the, the, where there were not a lot of other people uh, working in the area. Uh, uh, what uh, what other major challenges did you face in in uh, in your pioneering research in in uh, neural networks? Well, if I understand your question right, so uh, the reason why I came into this field and uh, started to cooperate with internationally and uh, being involved in the organizations was that uh, people knew my books. I had three books, which uh, were. Uh, uh, discussing this, uh, my, my associated memory models and this self-organizing map models. So I was actually invited uh, to give some lectures. Uh, one was uh, uh, in, in a series of, well, uh, whatever, American Optical Society. Oh, right. uh, and, and then uh, I was, uh, you know, when we started uh, these big conferences in 1987, so I was first lectured there. And there's some mention of that in this book you were showing me. The Talking Nets has some discussion of these early uh, early conferences, the, yeah. the Snowbird Conference. And I some. was never in Snowbird. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, but 
where you end but up. But they say INNS conferences. Right. The, so the first IEEE, ICN, in, in San Diego, 1987. Yes. We were both there. Yes. I remember course. meeting you there. That uh, was the first time I met you. Two years before that, 1985, I was in an Optical Society of America meeting, which was held in, in the Xerox establishment and uh, there Washington. Did and Harold Sue yes, organize that? Yeah, I thought yeah, so. and, uh, okay. Yes, yes. And uh, there I was giving my first lecture on the self-organizing maps. Oh, great. I remember uh, I, I showed a film, um, a, a real film uh, on the projector and uh, Robert Heck Nielsen was shouting there, this is what I call self-organization. <laughs> ah, good, good. Yes. Uh, Robert was one of my early inspirations uh, yeah. to, uh, in this And field. he was the person who actually uh, 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 spread my ideas in the United States more than in anybody else. Good. Because he accepted those into his products. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, I met him about a year before he started his company. And, and uh, yeah, he, 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 brought, uh, he brought several of the uh, main contributors to neural networks to the attention of a lot of young people like myself. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was very good about that. Um, so, uh, what contribution gives you the greatest satisfaction? You've made so many. Oh, of course, this uh, self organizing map, uh, because oh. uh, I have been working on it since 1981, mm -hmm. and uh, almost uh, without interruption, and uh, always trying to find out uh, either new variations on it for different kinds of information, or improved algorithms, or whatever, and then finally teaching people how to write scripts. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it certainly continues to be very fundamentally important. Um, what do you think is the impact that the, the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society or the IEEE Neural Network Society, the IEEE Neural Network Council, or the International Neural Network Society, these professional societies that have grown up around our field since the mid-1980s, uh, what do you think is the impact that these societies have had on you? Uh, they have created a very good platforms for discussion and uh, uh, thinking on ideas in, in the talks and after talks and in, in the private meetings. So uh, it would not have spread as fast as if we didn't have these, these societies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I was first uh, active in them, and also I was uh, one of the editors in chief of Neural Networks. Yes, so, uh, but but uh, uh, after that, uh, I started to withdraw from the activities. I'm working here in Finland. Uh, I had only a very small group here, and uh, and uh, then you know what is uh, happening. <laughs> yeah, so did John Taylor take over as the editor for the yes. European side? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. Yes. right. Yeah, I remember all that. Yes. Yeah. I visited plenty of conferences, but then I ha started to have this uh, series of my own workshops uh, mm -hmm. on this uh, self-organizing maps uh, since uh, 1997. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it, it has uh, continued biannually since then, and now it is uh, in 18 months uh, comes a new conference, so it is accelerating mm -hmm. and okay. spreading to Latin America. Oh, good. And what's the title of these workshops? WSOM, Workshop, workshop on Self-Organizing Maps. Oh, very good. So it's going to where, Brazil now? It was in Brazil uh, in uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. After that, it was once in Germany, in Midweida. Oh. Uh, and uh, now the next one will be in Texas in uh, January next year. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, where in Texas? In Houston. Very interesting. Wow. Will you go? I don't know. I, I don't know because <laughs> I have certain limitations. Well, these at things. This age. <laughs> right. The, uh, it's very satisfying when you get something started and it and it and it gets its own uh, uh, its own adherents and proponents and people make it move forward. That, that, that's yes. a very satisfying thing about uh, about starting things in science and technology. Um, 
Well, and in fact, uh, uh, so you, you've uh, answered part of my next question, which was what impact have you made on these societies in this community? So of course you've started workshops, you've been an editor-in-chief, you've... Uh, in, uh, in the government uh, of the INNS. Right, you you were on the board, of course, yeah, uh, so yeah, you're yeah. an INNS fellow, which is only former board members are yes. eligible for that yes. honor, uh, and they they have to have served with distinction as well. So uh, Also, I, I was the person who was establishing the European Neural Network Society. I was the first chairman. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, very good. Um, uh, so, so you certainly had a lot of impact on the field, and you and and you helped make some of the our early conferences very successful as well. You've, uh, you've there been have involved. been quite and nice conferences. Uh, in uh, sometimes uh, 1991, we had the first uh, uh, neural network conference, European Society conference, and it came back to Finland in uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. Did you come to IJCNN also that year? It was in Seattle that year, IJCNN yes, 91. Yes, I, I thought so. Yeah. I thought I remembered yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that, uh, I, uh, I was there too. Um, okay. So, um, and what about the impact that uh, that these societies have made on engineering and science? Um, well, uh, I think that uh, uh, there are certain applications uh, which are very good. I haven't seen uh, much impact on the general computer technology uh, because these uh, uh, algorithms uh, don't need uh, new computers. Uh, the present day computers are as powerful as the first gray supercomputer. Right. <laughs> or even much more co powerful, so you can compute quite big problems uh, uh, just by pro programming. Mm -hmm. But uh, then there are interesting applications. I don't know how wide they are spread, but uh, they are very interesting, and I could mention m many of them, mm -hmm. like, like uh, trying to land. Uh, airplanes automatically or uh, in, in, in a, and uh, all sorts of control uh, problems in industry control of processes communications mm -hmm. I think that we could uh, recommend uh, uh, better, better uh, encoding systems for the television but uh, they are very conservative, so they don't, don't want to listen to us. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things are that way, but certainly the uh, anything pattern recognizing uh, has, has that is a very very large yeah. field, and uh, yeah, this uh, computational intelligence and neural networks have really contributed much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of things. Uh, not not to talk of special uh, applications like criminology or uh, mm -hmm. or. Uh, uh, like a classification of galaxies mm -hmm. or whatever. Oh, sure. There have been some very successful things in uh, oh, uh, inverse models, for example, where you uh, NASA was doing some things where you where you have uh, images that you're looking at, and you can you can look through something very expensive like the Hubble. Uh, space telescope or a, a very large array of radar telescopes, and, yeah. but then you can look through cheaper instruments, and so people have done those mappings to make yes. uh, to try to get more out of the cheaper instruments. There's so many things that have been. I, I, I have no time to tell all about it. <laughs> right, right. We could we could uh, spend days talking about them. Well. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to speculate about the, the evolution of computational intelligence and expected confluence of uh, computational intelligence technologies, any potential new entries. Uh, what, what's your prognosis for the... For the now field? look, uh, we have one of the biggest problems uh, with the old and handicapped people and all sorts of aids for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these methods, uh, technologies, uh, would be very good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, like um, basic technology for, for these devices. Uh, 
because uh, neural networks have been used uh, for making robots, why not also these interactive devices? And uh, inversions you need uh, when you are converting neural signals into actuators and so on. So I think that uh, this uh, uh, health technology is one uh, very, very big area. Also in diagnostics, I believe, uh, uh, computational intelligence uh, in general has uh, created uh, many, like the, these uh, databases for doctors and uh, automatic diagnoses and so on. Then in, in communications, uh, there is an unlimited uh, field of applications in, in, uh, in, in traffic, uh, automatic vehicles and so on. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of potential to, uh, to improve the safety and, and, and improve the level of automation and improve the flow, uh, so many things there and, and, and some impacts that have already happened, the Human Genome Project. Uh, yes, exactly, uh, yes, yes. the bioinformatics yeah. is a very, very big area and I have a dream <laughs> that you could create much better macroeconomic models. Mm -hmm. So, oh, so yeah. to control the world economy or the macroeconomies. Yeah, the, uh, the, these things obey laws too, but they're just more complex because they yeah. involve human behaviors. But they, but yeah, they exactly, and that is one of the obstacles that people say that you cannot model the human behavior. But uh, but, uh, but you can, model but, but you can combine. You, you you can make uh, uh, models uh, which combine uh, both the theoretical. Uh, laws and uh, experimental laws mm -hmm. which can, uh, obtain t can be obtained from human behavioral tasks and uh, so, so uh, this kind of hybrid technology is possible. Yeah, and, and really you're concerned with the behavior of large groups of humans. You don't need to model a single human. So it, it yeah, it helps it's even more accurate with the <laughs> large yeah, groups. <laughs> yeah, it helps a lot. So there, there, there's a lot of potential uh, for, for these areas. Um, do you predict any scientific or technological breakthroughs involving computational intelligence technologies? Uh, it is very hard to say because uh, if it is a breakthrough, it must be a surprise, which I don't know yet. Right. If, uh, uh, With so. the present technologies, I know very good, but uh, uh, but uh, I have only talked about them. <laughs> right. So. so it, it's typical to science that uh, you don't know even a day beforehand uh, when the uh, new invention comes. That's right. That's right. Uh, we, we have been, we have heard about this uh, the chemical computers, and we have heard about this uh, uh, quantum mechanical computers. I think that they are good for special purposes, like. Uh, uh, let's say like a cryptology or something like that, but whether they are good for general purpose computing, very deep uh, uh, semantics, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be that the breakthroughs come in, uh, in multiple special purpose computers. Maybe the, maybe the general purpose computer is an idea that has too much limitations and maybe these special purpose applications will yeah. Uh, will be the breakthrough. Who knows uh, yeah. what could happen? So, um, certainly the uh, certainly the monolithic model of a computer uh, is already going away because yeah. things are getting so distributed. And and so the uh, the temptation has always been to go to one computer because they they Moore's law has made them twice as powerful every eighteen mm -hmm. months. Uh, but even now, with graphics processing units and with embedded computing, you see so many things in cyber physical systems. You see so many things becoming distributed. And exactly, exactly. Yes, you have much better graphic possibilities for videos and uh, uh, and uh, whatever so is needed uh, in, in uh, aids for communication, goggles and whatever. Right, and the market is so big too. Yeah. The money is driving it because the market for those things yeah. are so big. Well, uh, before the start of the interview, you were telling me about some of these other articles of a historical interest. So, there, uh, in this book, Talking Nets, which I recommend to anybody interested in the history of this field, this book was published in the 1980s, right? 
Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and so there, there's a, a wonderful interview of you in that book. Yes. Uh, I think you've got a bookmark. Uh, it's MIT. MIT Copyright by MIT. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so, uh, so um, anyway, yeah, the Talking Nets, there's this, and, and I've read this before, it's a monthly interview uh, of a lot of the, uh, the subjects of these uh, uh, history interviews, a lot of them are in here, a lot more of them will be, uh, so, and then, uh, and then this much more recent article, this was when you won the Rosenblatt Award, right, and appeared in, in this issue of the computation, computational intelligence magazine, uh, so that was uh, around uh, 08. Or uh, let's see, this is August 2008, mm -hmm. and and so uh, we we saw each other the month before that or that month at the World Congress on Computational Intelligence yes. in in Hong Kong. Yes. And, uh, and and so that's where they uh, formally recognized you with the Rosenblatt Award. That's a that's a very major one. Um, <clears throat> so these are some uh, some great references that people can look up in in addition to uh, to what you've learned from this video. Um, so uh, do you have any other uh, remarks that you'd like to share with our audience? I can only wish you everything good, much success uh, to this, these societies and uh, to the field of science and so on. I, I, I think that uh, I don't want to make any very particular uh, remarks. I thank you for your interview. Well, kitos podio, kitos. Kitos. Palion. <laughs> Kitos Palion. Kitos Palion. I enjoyed it very much too. Thank you so much.